So welcome back to the second panel on day four of, uh, of Centre Court and the switch now to careers. And as we've already seen in the first three days of uh, Centre Court, these careers panels are proving just as popular uh, as the admissions panels. We've had uh, as many as 150,000 people watching some of the different panels and uh, no, no reason to be any different today. I've got a great uh, bunch of panelists that are joining us from uh, across the US and also from uh, Asia. Uh, and I'm sure some very uh, interesting perspectives that that will bring. So uh, who do we have? I'm, I'm welcoming, um, um, my eyesight's gone bad poor, it's uh, Liz Gillia, who is the Senior Director of uh, MBA Career Management at uh, Emory in, in Goizeta. Liz, it's, uh, it's great to have you with us. Happy to join, thank you. And uh, Dimitri Wons, who uh, is uh, joining us from uh, Michigan Ross, he's one of the Career Services uh, coordinators uh, for the program in Ann Arbor. Dimitri, welcome. Glad to be here. Uh, Phil Hevelin uh, is uh, from Rice. Uh, Phil is the executive director of career development and he'll be telling us that there's uh, more than uh, oil uh, is, as part of the opportunities for Houston uh, MBAs. Phil, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. And it's great to welcome back uh, Sean Ferguson, who is the Associate Dean of the Asia School of Business, this fascinating collaboration with the uh, MIT Sloan. Uh, Sean, we already, always appreciate the fact that you join us and it's close to midnight, uh, you know, the hours that you keep, but you always look fresh. Um, so, you know, here we have uh, the MBA class of 2020, uh, as they went into business school uh, a couple of years ago. Things looked uh, very different, and, and perhaps just start with uh, each of you, starting with Liz, maybe, uh, just you know what you're seeing uh, for, for this um, this current class, um, and you know how uh, your graduates are coping with the sort support of the alumni, and of course all of the skills uh, and characteristics that they've honed during the two years uh, in the program at Goizeta. Yeah, absolutely. I think we talked a little bit, uh, this group talked a little bit just a couple minutes ago about resilience. And I think that for the class of 2020, this is absolutely going to be a class that is remembered for being resilient because the job market looks so different now from when they started. But when we're looking at our students, you know, the students that have just graduated, I think, you know, the majority of them, especially the ones that looked for structured and secured structured MBA positions. You know, we're doing things in the, those kind of traditional MBA areas like consulting, corporate finance, marketing, leadership development programs. You know, they all are, are faring very well, I think, with what is happening in the job market. Obviously, some start dates are being pushed back. You know, sometimes they're having to thought, talk about, you know, doing um, the beginning part of their jobs virtually or onboarding virtually or just kind of having to adapt to new operations of business like we all are right now. But I think that, you know, they're, they're coming out strong they are feeling like they left with a strong skill set and they know that what we're dealing with right now is obviously temporary. And I think that what they've learned during this time period and how they're going to be able to come out and jump into their jobs, even if they're done in a new way, is really going to set them up for success. So I think the tone is, is definitely is definitely positive, um, certainly for students that are looking for more kind of just-in-time, experienced hire roles, that's obviously going to be a little bit more immediately impacted. And, you know, when we're talking with those students, the main message is about flexibility, about patience, about resilience, um, and just working really closely with those students to make sure that their needs are met and they're still able to pursue something that they're excited about. And, and so some of the sectors where you're seeing that, you know, still strong demand, you mentioned uh, consulting, what, supply chain, I mean, healthcare has to be an area where uh, demand is very high. And any other sectors where you feel that there's uh, going to be particular strong demand this year? Yeah, we, I mean, definitely healthcare and things in tech, things in the tech industry, but obviously the functions within that tech industry can be pretty varied. And I think for a lot of our students, you know, maybe even right now looking a little bit smaller than those large companies, ones that can be a little bit more dynamic, um, can staff up a, a, like with a little bit, you know, um, more speed. Um, I know a lot of the students we're talking to right now are looking in the startup community in ways that they hadn't considered before. Um, and so that's something that we're keeping an eye on for kind of long term uh, growth opportunity for our students. Right. Uh, Phil, of course, you, you know, the students at Rice, as with all of the other top schools, um, have ended their uh, MBA experience um, with uh, virtual classes, you know, working still with all of their classmates, but doing so uh, virtually. They're already demonstrating to the future 
uh, employer that ability to adapt to changing conditions. Do you think that's something that they can leverage? Absolutely. And in fact, that's the angle that we're often taking with our students who are either have already accepted a position and will be uh, matriculating into a, a, a new role or those who are still on the market. You know, companies are going to be looking back at this time and, and for those who are still applying and, and interviewing for jobs, you know, they're really interested to, to hear how students and recent graduates are, are managing this this time period right now. They want to know, I'm very interested to hear how they are maximizing uh, this, this time. Are they, are they using it to perhaps uh, upskill a bit, maybe doing a little bit of independent uh, learning if they've graduated and they already have the MBA in hand and they're still on the market. But companies, you know, that, that provides insight into the character of that individual. And that's something that they're going to use as part of their evaluation. So if you are someone who is and in a position where you're still on the market, uh, be prepared to uh, describe what you've been doing to adapt and to, you know, still maintain a you know high level of positive positivity. Because, quite honestly, those are the types of people that companies want on their team. Right, and of course, uh, you know, Rice graduates um, typically then pursue careers across all sorts of sectors. One of them naturally would have been energy, uh, and if if that's looking a bit grim with the price of oil right now. How are they then adapting and saying, well, okay, in the immediate short term, uh, I might not be able to pursue those sort of opportunities, but then you know, exploring many other uh, different fields? Yeah, we, we use the term diversification quite a bit. We use diversification in our employer development. We use diversification in uh, job uh, and career development strategy. And so uh, for anyone who's familiar with oil and gas, there's, there's upsides and there's downsides. It's a bit of a roller coaster uh, industry. And, and so being in that industry is going to, you're going to develop some level of resiliency uh, uh, just, uh, just by being a part of it. But yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, for, for anyone um, uh, who, who's interested in MBA, I think looking broadly at the, the various opportunities and thinking about uh, you know, what are the contingencies if, you know, plan A doesn't work out to have a, a strong plan B in place? Right. Of course, Ann Arbor is a wonderful place to spend two years, uh, Dimitri, but uh, Ross graduates then go on to pursue careers on the East Coast, the West Coast, uh, through the Midwest and internationally. Um, what, what does the picture look like both domestically and, and for those that are then using that MAP program at Ross to explore the next international steps of their career? Yeah, so I continue to be amazed by the resilience of Ross students and the Ross alumni network. So I'm, I'm seeing students who are staying in Ann Arbor. I get to run into them around town, which is, which is fun. We're both wearing masks, of course. Uh, but it's, it's incredible, the resilience they've shown. Um, continuing to interview with firms all over the country and all over the world, um, despite the fact that, that we're in, a, in an entirely virtual world at this point. Um, so I'm just, I'm just amazed at the amount of traction that students are continuing to have despite all that's going on, their positive attitude, a lot of continued interest and traction in the tech space. Um, a lot of those tech companies have been making it a priority to hire even more despite all that is going on. Um, and a flood of alumni who are reaching out to the career office and the students asking how they can help, um, really wanting to, to pass it, pay it forward at this point. Right. Well, I, I guess uh, for next year's center court, if we're still doing them on the Zoom platform, there'll be a Michigan MBA that will be a part of that core team. <laughs> As you said, you know, tech has really um, provided uh, lots of opportunities. Sean, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, everyone's back at school. Um, I don't know, across Southeast Asia and in Malaysia. D does that mean that uh, the, the Asian market will be a little bit further ahead in terms of opportunities opening up as we come out of the pandemic? Yeah, I think... Um... You know, I wouldn't say we had the benefit of being first, but I think uh, we've kind of got a better handle on how the pandemic is playing out. Um, if, if you look at recent surveys, um, McKinsey just did a consumer sentiment survey across the different geographies across the world. And by far, the, 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 consum the most optimistic groups are countries in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, domain. And so, um, you know, at ASB, uh, in last year's class, about 52% of the students went to work in the tech industry, and we were seeing trends in that direction as well. Um, 
you know, one of the things that's also kind of played to the favor is that in, in Asia, the NBA has always been kind of a micro uh, process when it comes to hiring. There's not large scale on campus recruiting, recruiting and such. And so it's always been very relational in this part of the world. And so um, in the past, we would always encourage students, well, you need to go to Hong Kong, Singapore here to get FaceTime, right? But the uh, with the proliferation of Zoom and uh, virtual meetings, it's actually facilitated even better networking for the students. And I think it's, it's given them, you know, the, the time to invest like on, on a, a trek to Singapore or a trek to Hong Kong. Uh, now with a, a Zoom call, you can cover so much more ground. And so, so uh, you know, our students have been really, really proactive with that. And we've been uh, supportive and, and, you know, at, at our school, you know, between our relationship with MIT, uh, and just the general relational nature of this region, we're able to do a really good job of connecting people with the right opportunity uh, holders and gatekeepers uh, to advance the career search process. You know, what we're also seeing is that, you know, technology, whether it's with traditional brick and mortars or startups or, or big tech, it's, it's strong across the board. And so, you know, people are looking for technology to drive cost savings and efficiency. Uh, to help come up with innovative ways to capture more revenue. And as you have a more, uh, a, I think one of the difference in this part of the world as well is that um, I think in the developed uh, and advanced economies, your consumer may be a tad bit over leveraged, right? Whereas here, uh, there's this aspiration and, and this growth and uh, growth in the middle class that I think uh, makes growth, you know, significant growth viable for a much longer period of time in this part of the world. So you know, my position, it, it, it's a tough market, um, but that you're much better off with an MBA from one of your top schools than, than without. Uh, so uh, perhaps starting with you, Liz, um, thinking about also how you work with, with graduating students, cause it's not just about, you know, the year they graduate, the first position, you know, they're going to do one MBA uh, and, and that will be a platform for the next 10, 15, 20 years of their career. So, so how do you then look at the enduring value of the MBA for them uh, and the sort of planning as a career services team that says, well, here are some opportunities uh, as you come out of school, but we've also talked about, you know, career growth and where you might be three to five years from now. Well, how does that discussion work with students? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the MBA is so versatile in terms of the skill set that you're building when you're thinking about it from like a hard and a soft skills perspective that, that continues to pay off in dividends as you think about your, your career later. How we think about that in the Career Management Center, so our alumni career services team is actually housed um, with the same office that we have. So a lot of what we think about with our career services is kind of joint programming where they're doing things for lifelong career development. We're doing a lot that's for immediate uh, success in the MBA recruiting process, but uh, there's a lot of overlap in terms of what good career growth and career development looks like. So, you know, as we think in our office about ways to move forward and how to do the programming that we do, whenever possible, you know, to open up workshops that are for alumni and students together to talk about, you know, career development opportunities that are going to serve them as they think about their job five years and 10 years down the road. You know, thinking about not just finding them that job, but making sure that they have tools uh, to feel really comfortable and prepared to be able to look for jobs after. So I think a lot of it on our end is kind of collaborating with what our alumni career services team is doing and then just knowing that our goal in the CMC is not just about finding them that we talk about thinking about their, their career development in a lifelong way. Right. And, and with the alumni network, Phil, I guess, uh, you know, there, there are Rice graduates from the financial crisis of 11 years ago or the dot-com bust of 18, 20 years ago. Um, that, that have themselves been through these sort of situations. Are, are you finding that they're proactively sort of reaching out or you know, provide a very valuable support network for this uh, graduating class of 2020? Uh, absolutely. In fact, I think for anyone who's thinking about an MBA, it's, it's not just a credential, it's an investment in a community that is going to be part of you for the duration of your professional and, and personal life. And so I think that's an important uh, aspect to consider when anyone's looking at a, at a program. You know, for us, again, because oil and gas, uh, we, we did see as, as part of the downturn furloughs and layoffs. And one of the first programs that we were able to coordinate with our alumni team is going back to those grads who graduated in 2009. And we put together a virtual panel similar to this 
uh, to give those uh, alumni an opportunity to share their experiences with the current 2020 class. And it was not only did they provide very tangible uh, actions that 2020 grads could take, but it was also just nice to hear that, you know what, it works out and there's going to be upturns, there's going to be downturns in, in your career uh, going forward and uh, you're going to get through this. And what's most important, I think, from our alumni is that you're, you're, you're not alone and you'll be able to leverage the alumni community to, to navigate uh, downturns to provide some, some insights into how you can be successful, even though maybe the job market is a little bit tighter than it has in, in the past. So uh, it, it's been, um, it, it's really been a lot of fun and really a pleasure to engage with our, our alumni as, as a means to support the 2020 grads. Right. And of course, uh, Ross graduates are always looking for an excuse to come back, Dimitri, and fill that extraordinary stadium for, for the game against Michigan State or whoever the rival is this year. Um, that close bond with the school it is really something, you know, Phil talks about how that, that will serve you, that, that network. It's, it's, it's a big family, right? And, and people look out for one another. Absolutely. It's it, the number of alumni events we've seen spawn up over Zoom uh, since the pandemic has struck has just been incredible. Uh, one we did recently was with graduates of 08, 09, talking to the recent graduates of this year, uh, sharing that, that experience of graduating into a recession, into a tougher market. Um, and it was just amazing to see that connection, you know, 10 years difference in time. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's become very popular for us to do our Zoom meetings with a virtual big house in the background. I, uh, I had been planning to do that for today, but um, was advised by Poets and Quant to, to, to maybe avoid that for technical difficulties. <laughs> you still, um, still got the M there. <laughs> I still got the M there, of course. Um, but it is, it's just, it's been amazing to see how technology has allowed that alumni bond to just really thrive. Um, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we'll get back into that stadium uh, sooner rather than later. Right. As it also then reflects on, on the classroom experience, because, you know, two years, you, you're creating some very close bonds with your classmates. They've all brought their own experience to those classroom discussions, but also are then collaborating together, I guess, as they collectively face this job market uh, and supporting one another with interview prep and case studies you know, and everything that they need uh, to shine in uh, the interview opportunities that they have. Yeah, absolutely. And one, one real interesting thing that happened was that the lockdown started just as our MAP project started this year. So students of the class of 2021 got an introduction to what this virtual look at work and collaboration starting a new consulting project entirely remote, uh, which I think gave them tremendous confidence going into their internship th this year. They already had an experience of forming a new team, establishing a client relationship all remotely uh, with a lot of support from the school and our faculty to, to help through that process. Right. Now, experiential learning, Sean, is something that you, from day one of launching the Asia School, uh, was key to the sort of experience that you were looking to give uh, individuals. Does that then itself create opportunities with, uh, with future employers? Yeah, so our, our action learning uh, program we do an action learning project every semester during the program. Uh, there's a faculty uh, advisor and an industry business coach with the students. And this has been probably the most transformational element of our, 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 our student experience. What, what happens is uh, the, the multiplicative nature of them doing the project and the iterative nature of doing it uh, really adds a level of versatility to their resume. So, you know, a student may come in with one experience in an industry or function and they can leave here with like four or five different industry functional experiences or uh, industry and functional experiences. And one of the cool things that we do is we don't just do it in Malaysia. The projects are all across Southeast Asia. And this year we've had projects as far as Saudi Arabia, all the way up to Korea. And so um, everyone's bought into the, the notion that uh, application of theory you know, helps make you have a, a greater impact uh, post business school. But being able to do it in so many different cultural settings, we think really positions our students for the uh, the ability to have a truly global career. And so in, in our last class, you know, we're tiny compared to everyone, but out of the 35 students, they went to work in about 14 different countries, uh, half stayed in Southeast Asia, but then half went all across the rest of the world. And we really attribute this to the uh, the nature of uh, the, the, the action learning experience. I think the other thing that 
our, our action learning experience does is because we engage with the company so many times, the projects are very aligned to what are the problems and the challenges that our, our corporate partners and employers are facing uh, in, in the marketplace, right? And so uh, it's really helped for our students to, you know, be able to tell a story and get placed uh, in a way that, you know, I haven't seen in, in my now professional career. Now, with all of the alumni that I speak to, and we've done lots of interviews with uh, with your graduates for, for Centre Court, um, you know, they talk about that relationship with their classmates and everything that they've learned from them. Occasionally, they'll talk about a particular professor. Um, but it always strikes me that it's the relationship that they have with you, with your teams, uh, yeah. this transformation that they go through. And, and so, you're, you know, the career services team, I just see as this, this hidden gem, uh, you know, the soft skills, holding up that mirror to, to the sort of characteristics that they then need to you know, display in the, the, the building of the next steps of, of their career. So, Liz, I'd love to, to sort of talk our viewers through the relationship that they can then expect to enjoy with you, both during the program and uh, once they've graduated. But we'll start even before they've arrived in the program uh, and your involvement with admissions. Now, as, as a career services team, um, do you discuss with your colleagues in admissions the profile of a particular candidate or what they've shared in terms of uh, their career goals to look at the coherence and credibility of those sort of goals? Yeah, we absolutely can do that um, and, and do have those conversations. Usually, you know, we're brought into the conversation um, to be able to talk through maybe a specific instance where they're trying to understand a little bit more about the feasibility of a career path, trying to understand how a specific background could work with specific career goals. Um, and we can provide a little bit of insight about what the recruiting process looks like for that type of path or students who we've seen in the past go through a similar process. So as we're thinking about working with applicants, as we're thinking about working with admins, it could also give us an opportunity to connect them with alumni who have done something similar, which can help set them up for success. Uh, I know our office has also had individual conversations with applicants or with uh, admitted students um, who maybe had specific career related questions or interesting goals or cases, you know, during the application process, just so that we can provide a little bit of insight because uh, anything to the point that you made, it's, it's important for people to start reflecting on and you can start thinking about their goals before they get started in the program. And so the earlier that we can be involved in those conversations and then even provide them with some resources to use to help them be successful, uh, the more we're going to be involved. Right. And, and, and Phil, that must be very exciting when, when you look at not quite a raw product, they're in their mid to late 20s, they've already got four, five, six years of professional experience and accomplishments to their name. But as you're then thinking, ah, you know, two years here with us in Rice, you know, th this person, the potential that we see in them, um, that, that, that must be an exciting moment to sort of project forward and imagine what that experience is Rice is going to bring to them for the next steps of their personal and professional development. Well, I think you, I think you just hit on why we all do what we do. <laughs> uh, we're, we're very much in the people business. And, you know, I, I think for, for me, my why is to be a, to do what I can, whatever I can to be a part of someone's success. And there's nothing more gratifying, I think, in, in what we do is to have someone come, come to us uh, after they've secured that internship or accepted that full-time offer to say, boy, I just really appreciate all the support, all of those meetings. You know, we talk about being in the trenches with our students, and that's so true. There's, there's times when we have really difficult conversations where maybe they didn't get the interview that they wanted. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they have family considerations. And then those moments when they accept uh, and they come to you uh, because they're so excited to share the news. It, it's, it's what keeps us going, and it's really fantastic to see that. But you're right. We're very lucky to have very collaborative uh, admissions team here with, with Janice Kennedy, who's participated in other Center Court uh, panels. A really fantastic team where we come together and we look at, especially those students who, you know, may have a unique uh, background, a unique career interest that, you know, want, they're interested in getting some insights from our team, very collaborative and really enjoy those conversations to talk through, uh, you know, potential uh, candidates fit and what they, what they want to do. And just to make sure that we're in a position to, to help them get there. And uh, we appreciate that partnership. And I think because that partnership is so close, uh, the students benefit from that. But I think you, uh, you really hit it on the head. That's, that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. 
Right. Now, of course, uh, the admissions team at Michigan, you know, Sujin, people try to read between the lines. Is she looking for this or what might this mean? Um, so, you know, she, she has all of the experience and insight to be able to share. But in, and then, uh, you know, working with the career services team at Michigan, other schools, they talk about post MBA career goals. Do candidates really have to have worked all of that out, Dimitri? Because, of course, that's part of the MBA experience, right? To then explore different sectors, different skill sets that are being revealed and where that might take the next steps of your career. Absolutely. No, they don't have to have it all worked out. Uh, what I think is important is that they have a hypothesis. And that's when I'm talking with prospective students or incoming students. I say, you know, the goal here is to get a hypothesis and have a really strong one that you can test out a number of different times. You know, apply that design thinking or scientific method mindset uh, during the MBA and run through a few different tests and experiments to see if your hypothesis hold tr holds true during an action-based learning project, an internship, a course, uh, a workshop, a conversation, whatever it is, um, to see if that really does line up with what your expectations and, and goals are. And that is, it's really fun to see people uh, work through those cycles, uh, see what they came in with uh, and how they evolved throughout the two years. It's really one of the most fun parts of the job. Right. And, and, and therefore, that speaks to what uh, recognizing the background and the experience that you've already acquired a, a certain level of self-awareness and, and, and reflection. What, what sort of really emerges in that initial assessment of an applicant that shows the sort of maturity uh, and an understanding of you know, their, their past and, uh, and accomplishments? So uh, something that really shows that the a successful applicant and candidate and somebody who's going to be successful in business school is they really understand that equation of their previous experience, skill set, and learnings, what the gaps are and how the program they're looking at is going to help them fill that gaps and what possibility or possibilities could then be the outcome of, of their previous experience plus that MBA. And people that have really thought that through and can articulate it and understand the nuance of what a program has to offer to fill those gaps are really successful. Mm, right. uh, Sean, of course, is a pioneer school in Southeast Asia. Uh, are you then looking for demonstration in someone's profile of um, an appetite for taking a risk or, or the sort of multicultural skills that will serve them well as they look to build the next steps of their international career? Yeah, so this environment, you know, we're, we're very honest and candid with student prospects. Like, this environment isn't for everyone. Uh, you know, I kind of liken it to, you know, uh, they used to say in the U.S., go west, young man or woman. And, uh, you know, we're, we're here, we're like, go east, young man or woman. And you have to have a frontier mindset for this part of the world, right? Um, you know, in our action learning program, our students are you know, you can be in a hot, sweaty factory in Indonesia or, you know, doing on the ground market research, you know, climbing upstairs with, with Tide from Procter & Gamble or something like that. And so we, we, we definitely need to, you know, be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And, and I think here we're looking for people who have that kind of appetite for uh, the unknown. They're not looking for anything too cushy. We also, when we evaluate people, we have kind of an untraditional approach uh, to, to looking for candidates. So um, the GMAT is optional. So we look for other academic markers and other indicators of impact in their career uh, so that we, we can see that, okay, they have a high spike. And um, if we see that high spike, then we feel like with our action learning curriculum and the nature of our program, we can bring out the best in the individual. Uh, and so that, that's a big part of our philosophy here. You know, in, in this current environment too, though, what we're telling people is, you have to be flexible and, and more than last year or two years ago, the career process starts from day one, right? And so it, it's not, when we say it starts from day one, it doesn't start with getting the job or the full-time job or the internship, but laying the groundwork. As, as I mentioned earlier in, in Asia, it's very relational. And so what you want to do to position yourself for success at the end of the, the end of the game is really you know, making sure you kind of have the informational meetings, building the relationships, whether it's in the ASB network, the MIT Sloan network, or, you know, your diaspora network. You know, if you're, if you're an Indian uh, and you went to St. Xavier's College in India, you, you probably can find someone from St. Xavier's College in, in Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, or Singapore, right? And you need to work at cultivating those networks. But, you know, you also have to think about, like, uh, the process, you know, Dimitri alluded to this, you have to have a hypothesis. And we don't care if your, your hypothesis is right. 
You know, if I used to joke when I was at, when I used to work at Rice at graduation, if I, if I said only the people who could graduate are those who are doing what they said in their admissions essay, nobody would graduate, right? Everyone evolves as they go through these different MBA programs. And so we're, 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 we're very high on potential, you know, max potential, and then a vision for your career and a thoughtfulness about it. It doesn't have to be super precise because you learn so much through this experience that you're, you're going to change. You, and, you know, we, we feel like you get new information throughout the program. You, sh you should be able to act on that information if that makes sense for you, your strengths, your motivation, and your interests. Right. Now we talk about the, uh, the MBA triple jumper that changes geography, they change sector, they change uh, function. Um, Liz, as, as, as they go through that journey, uh, that, that sort of exploration of different career opportunities, uh, they're picking up all of these, you know, marketing, finance, accounting, strategy skills. Um, but the career services team is presumably also helping to coordinate a lot of the, the softer skills, um, whether it's in communication and, of course, how they uh, come across an interview, you know, working in, uh, in teams, holding up that mirror to them. How, how does that actually work? And, and you know, either with your team, uh, developing the sort of careers related skills that are going to serve them well in a future interview or as in those next steps of their career. Or, yeah, where I'm actually thinking about this right now because we're starting this process with our one year MBA students who just started just a few weeks ago. Um, well, the way that we do it is kind of a combination of two things. So it's um, structured career education. And the way that we do it is with a professional development course that they take uh, in their first semester when they're taking their core courses. Um, it gives kind of the fundamentals, both the, you know, the tactical things that they need and then the softer skills that they need in order to be successful in recruiting. So anything from networking to interviewing, uh, you know, to putting together a good resume and cover letter, like all of those kind of foundational things that they need. And within that is a lot of interactive workshops that give them a chance to practice those things, get feedback from others, reflect on them, and then seek to improve them. So that's kind of the structured side. But concurrent with the course, the professional development course that we take, there's obviously the individual coaching that we're able to do. And I think where that real transformation happens is where we can sit with a student and identify where their gaps are, where maybe their anxieties are, where their strengths are, and then create a strategy and a plan with them that plays specifically to those things. So where the course gives them all of the foundational stuff they need to kind of across the board, they take that information, go to a meeting individually with their coach, who they work with throughout their time in the program, and then create a strategy that's going to be more individual and personalized. And given the size of our program, those coaches are checking in with their, you know, with their students on a very regular basis. And so we're watching that transformation happen. We're talking about things that you can iterate to make sure that, you know, you're spending more time doing, you know, point A and let maybe less time doing point B because you've already been able to improve there. So I think the combination of workshops and individual coaching is really what gets students kind of across the finish line in terms of making change. And, and for both the, the, those students that you've just welcomed in for the one-year program, but I guess those uh, in the two-year program, um, the fact that uh, all of those exchanges have moved virtual, I, I guess, in, uh, in recent weeks and months, um, has, has that changed the, the individual coaching and the dynamic? Or are you still able to have uh, you know, the same very thoughtful um, and, and insightful discussions? You, you are able to have the same discussions. I mean, I think, you know, certainly a little bit is lost without having that in-person interaction, but I also think when all of us are working virtually and working at home, um, there is a desire for connection. And so I think that people are pouring a lot of that energy and that interest in connecting with others into the way that they're engaging via these online platforms. And so, you know, if you are working individually in your home all the time, but you are able to have that coaching appointment or able to connect with people in a workshop where you're practicing your elevator pitch or practicing your interviewing skills, uh, that's a connection that I think is really important as we go about our days right now, all virtually. And so uh, I think we've been able to use platforms like Zoom to, to adapt and make that work. And in some ways, some of those things can happen in even a more streamlined way. You know, there are breakout rooms within these virtual platforms. There's easy ways to find, you know, uh, an opportunity to connect and they don't have to try to find space on campus you know a room that's available to be able to do so so um so i think we're trying to make the most of it and certainly we're still seeing this thing good payoff in the play phil you were talking about you know why you love doing what you do as, as you look at the careers curriculum at, at rice 
Um, is there a particular component that is almost like this aha moment for, you know, individuals that graduated from college, they've, you know, got their heads down and, you know, invested great time, energy in the first four, five, six years of, of the, their career. And now there's this opportunity to step back and, you know, really think about whether it's purpose, you know, the direction that they take, skill sets they may not really realize that, that they had. And yet you're able to demonstrate to them how they could, uh, you know, explore and develop those skills. Is, is there an, an aha moment in the careers curriculum? That's a fun question to respond to because I just had an aha moment with a, a student just the other day and it was um, related to an exercise that we'll often incorporate with students who are interested in just exploring different versions of yourself. And so in, in career services now you hear a lot referred to uh, around uh, life design theory and what Bill Burnett and uh, Dave Evans have done at Stanford's Life Design Lab. And one of, their, one of their exercises is odyssey planning. And so what this does is this gives any, any individual an opportunity to, it gives them permission to explore different versions of their self. If they were to go a traditional uh, MBA career path down consulting, what might that life look like the next five years, both professionally and what, is, what does it mean for you personally? Maybe there's a path where you start a business, which is completely different. And so what, what factors and considerations, opportunities could that person realize if they went down the path of maybe exploring and, and starting their own business, putting together a prototype, finding a fellow founder and, and going down that path. And uh, for anyone who is struggling with what to decide next, it can be a very enlightening exercise. And, and that's something that's one of those um, exercises amongst many that we all pull from depending on you know what is what is the students uh, maybe struggling with at this point in their their job search uh, that we can pull one of these exercises and to help frame the conversation to help move them forward and and so that was something that you know, I did recently with with a student and at the end of it was boy after going through this exercise I want to try this path and so now it gets into what are the very specific tangible next steps in terms of connecting you with companies, alumni who can help you better understand what that, what that life looks like so that you can start iterating it and trying it on and determine if it's something you want to go full bore into. Right. No, it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, chance to explore when, when you know, we talk about this investment in yourself uh, and to look at you know, what would life look like. Um, you know, you provide this incredibly structured environment for them to really explore those uh, ideas. Um, how, how does it work at Ross Dimitri? Because, of course, you know, they're all excited as they, they, they come in for meeting these classmates they perhaps already connected with through social media. Uh, and, you know, they'll, they'll be jumping into all of the, the classroom learning. W what is the intensity of the interaction that you then have as, as a career services team? that takes them through that journey, perhaps prepares them for first year um, or the summer internships. How quickly do things get started? So things get started quickly. Um, we have already met with, I'd say over a third of our class, close to half the class coming in. So, so appointments start soon after people matriculate, uh, we start doing what we call launch appointments with the career office. So we have an entire course that they'll work through uh, the summer before their first year. And we'll have a first appointment where we really get to hear all about their background, their career aspirations, how they might spend their time at Ross. Um, and then when they come to arrive on campus, we have more intense in-person interactions uh, where we get to process a lot of the summer and prepare even more for the, the fall. And then we have something called functional accountability career teams. Uh, we have an entire team of about 80 pure coaches that, that are MBA twos that work. Eight, 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 zero. Eight, zero. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have these MBA two peer coaches. They're trained and hired by the career office and they lead weekly sessions by function and industry of groups of five to 10 students each. Uh, so there's one for tech, there's one for consulting and so on. And th those will meet weekly throughout the, the first year of recruiting. Uh, on top of that, the career office of staff will meet individually with students. Uh, we'll ha have workshops and everything from interviews to uh, um, resumes and, and so on. Um, so we get started early and then it's, it's, really, uh, it's really intense. Um, and it's also, at the pace the students want it, want it to have. Um, so some students will meet with us 
very frequently. Others feel like they, they need to meet with us a little less frequently, uh, but we really like to meet with them where they are. Um, and I think that that one of my personal favorite uh, meetings of a student's journey is that first one at the beginning of their second year to hear really about that summer internship experience, how they're thinking about that full-time job. Um, that to me, that the difference between the first meeting and that, that meeting at the beginning of the second year is just uh, often very profound and, and really a fun, fun experience to have. Um, Sean, from experiences you've had at Rice, at, at HKUST, now your position at ASB, it, when, when you're addressing a, a graduating class, what is, uh, what is it your advice to them as they've been through the program and they're about to take the next steps of their career? Yeah, so I think um, career management doesn't stop at graduation is the number one point that I make to people. And it, it's, it's not that you're looking for the next job, right? But uh, I think what, you know, people, uh, guys, there's a one letter difference between networking and not working. And it's, it's not for the, the one network point is not going to get you a job. It's, it's kind of the, it's the, the approach to life and, and professional development uh, that's that's uh, with with regards to networking that's really going to pay off for you and, and so you can go through a lot of discovery learn a lot identify connections within an organization outside of an organization and so don't turn off the the networking just because you have a, a job now you, you know a lot of times you know what you will find as you network is that networking is also a great way for you to have success in your career from new ideas, concepts, and people from outside of the space that you've kind of already cultivated. And so that, that's my number one thing uh, for people. And so like, if you're, if you're an ASB, if I, when you graduate and you're an ASB alum and you go to Shanghai, try and see if you can have a coffee or a lunch with an ASB or MIT Sloan alum uh, and, and try to make that a part of your routine and, and, and be active with it. And that's my number one advice to, to people, right? Now, when, when we rely on um, the, the, the media, US News, the FT, they, they tend to fixate on, on post-MBA salaries as you graduate or three years later. When, when we dive into um, the employment uh, reports, uh, Liz, do, do you have any advice to individuals on how to use sort of placement reports that say, well, you know, 23% of our class went into tech, 28% went into consulting, but to be able to scratch the surface and sort of understand is it the sort of tech or the role in tech that you might be looking for? Because the big picture can uh, sometimes uh, be lacking in more personal detail for that individual. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I think the employment report is can be extraordinarily helpful just to get a sense of what um, where different classes have gone from a function and industry perspective, what salaries look like, maybe a handful of companies that have hired those students. Um, but I think, you know, we especially think that the research needs to go a little bit beyond the employment report because of our class size. And so the percentages can change in a big way class to class when we're only talking, you know, about 160, 170 students. Um, it can look very different depending on what the class size looks like. Um, so I always tell students, you know, LinkedIn is a tool that every person has access to. And so the employment report can give you a picture of where a class ended up, but you can use a lot of those same types of search terms to understand where alumni are actually working from the business school by looking through their LinkedIn profile. And then what you also get through that is an understanding of where they were before they got into that job, maybe the moves that they've taken since they've graduated from the MBA. And it also makes like a short list for you to think about who you're going to be networking with once you start the program. So I think the employment report is absolutely a, a crucial thing to look at before, but thinking about how you combine that with conversations and maybe research into what people are actually doing and how um, statistics play out in real way. And, and I guess, Phil, you know, an employment report at Rice would go beyond oil and gas and, and you know, show that that breadth of um, opportunities across different industries. You know, sometimes, do, do you want to tell people, well, you know, Rice is so much more. What, 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 what do you love to share in terms of that breadth of um, opportunities that they have? Well, I couldn't agree with Liz more. I, I think, you know, the employment reports are a data point, but they're just one data point. And what's difficult to convey through these types of reports is just the, the, the personal feedback and insights and experiences that these folks have in these various industries. 
in a rice business, we have uh, consulting and financial services as our two top industries, and then it's uh, energy, it's oil and gas. And so, uh, you know, it's important to to look at the reports, but also understand it's just a snap, snapshot in time and that oftentimes many folks after two or three years decide to move on to, to something else. And, and as, as Sean noted, uh, you know, careers are lifelong and, and people are going to pivot and continue to pivot moving forward. And, and so, you know, the employment reports are very important and uh, provide context as to what students do after they graduate, but also the MBA is a, is a long-term play. And, uh, and so it's important to have conversations with graduates of, of programs that you're targeting who recently graduated, but also maybe five, 10 years out, uh, what are they doing? What's the long-term projection for, uh, for the credential that you're about to earn? Drawing on uh, those LinkedIn profiles that, that Liz was um, referring to, uh, Dimitri, is, is there, a, in terms of the life cycle after the MBA, is, is there a pivotal moment you think three, four, five years after the MBA, they've got that initial post MBA experience, it's served them well, it's consolidated, you know, a lot of the learning that they've done in the program at Ross. Um, and, and then it's typically the next step that they take that will really define uh, the following 10, 15 years of their career path. Yeah, I do. It's it's really, it's fun to hear about that when I have alumni panels, folks talking about how they viewed that first job and how they're viewing that first step afterwards. And, uh, you know, an approach I've often heard is people thinking about that first job as a postdoc, an opportunity to, to polish off the skill set that they started learning as a, as a business school student, and that they really want to carry with them throughout the rest of their career. And then for that next career move, thinking about you know, what trade-offs do I want to make at this stage of my life? And what, what skills do I really want to double down on? Um, but I, I love hearing people talk about that first post-MBA pivot. And you often hear them going back to what they experienced uh, in business school, because they got such a good comprehensive overview um, of so many different industries and functions, develop such a network that they can really lean on as they make that, that post-MBA um, career pivot. Right, They'll, you'll see them often coming back to our alumni career um, services uh, staff member, coming back to their classmates, coming back to us, and talking to us about how they want to make that next move and what trade-offs they want to make. And it's it's a fun conversation to have. Well, someone's just written and, and described all of you as the unsung heroes of of the business school experience, and, and I think picking up on your idea, Liz, of you know looking at LinkedIn profiles, but. Um, and any additional ways, uh, perhaps, that um, prospective students can really get a sense of uh, the opportunities, the pathways, you know, that, that it's not everyone piles into consulting. I mean, it's so broad. D Dimitri, when, when you, you know, meet prospective um, applicants that are trying to weigh up uh, Michigan versus other schools, how, how do you help them to think about the, the broader picture of, of career opportunities that are available to them? So I do, I tell them looking at our employment report is good, looking at LinkedIn is good. And then I also encourage them to, to look at the people who have the jobs they're thinking of having and at least look at their profile, maybe have a conversation with them and think really strategically about how will an MBA help me get there? How will this specific program help me get there? What is that network like there? Um, and I think that often helps them clarify kind of what is it that I want here and, and is this step that I'm planning to take going to get me there. Um, so I think LinkedIn is a fantastic tool for that. Um, just looking at some of these profile and seeing the paths, there's a lot about what might get you to where you want to be going. Sean, you talked about, you know, that McKinsey report, you know, the, the looking for talent across the, uh, the, the Asian market. As, as you look ahead in the next five, 10 years, what, what do you think is going to be some of the strongest career opportunities in uh, Southeast Asia? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really about, you know, bringing new business models to this part of the world. Um, you know, what, you know, my philosophy is that if you can create, innovate, manage and apply, you'll find something out in this part of the world. And, and, and you know, I think, you know, one of the challenges is that people want to focus on this one silver bullet in the educational experience. And I think um, what you want to do is really uh, position yourself to develop a, a array of skills that can be redeployed in many different ways because we don't really know what the future is going to hold right and so like you know with us our approach to action learning is to build a future-proof skill set through you know uh through through a series of 
uh, you know, repeated projects, you know, you refine this kind of toolkit. And I've always thought that the MBA is kind of like the Swiss Army knife of graduate degrees, right? So if we drop you into the corporate jungle anywhere, you'll be okay. And, and that's, that's where I think you never hear a, a, an MBA alum from a top school like Rice, Michigan, or, or Emory say, yeah, you know what, I wish I didn't do it, right? They're, they're always effusive about these kind of de uh, degrees. And it's not just a piece of paper. Right, you know, there's always in the popular press, is the NBA dead, is it relevant, or that kind of thing. And it's like, no, it's, it's never dead. If you look at the salaries from the Financial Times or, you know, the Economist or wherever, uh, MBAs from top schools outperform almost every other segment. Now you can find an exceptional case in another uh, do domain, right? Uh, you know, but, and say, oh, this guy didn't have an MBA and they did well. But it's like that's the exceptional case. Like there's 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 no one educational degree that has the kind of upward trajectory, and, and it's, it's firmly because of the general management nature of the program, where you develop this multifunctional skill set. And because in Southeast Asia, uh, the, the challenges are rapidly evolving here, uh, I think you know you can almost do whatever you want to do here. Tech is leading the way. But you know, uh, people are looking to innovate and deliver solutions and customize models for this part of the world, right? We, you know, I had an alum who went to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, VC firm that was they weren't doing anything really innovative. They were taking models from Europe, the United States, or wherever, and launching startups and adapting those models for Southeast Asia, right? And so I think, uh, you know, having the versatility to be able to to work cross-culturally and in different markets. I think that's what's gonna really help students do well in this part of the world in the future, right? So, so we began Center Court today with um, colleagues of yours from ad admissions, looking at um, uh, a world that needs great leadership, um, a world that needs dialogue, you know, a, a society that is divided, the, the, the unrest of, of the last week alone. Um, and, and therefore, you know, the role that the admissions office plays is they attract diverse profiles, people who, you know, never imagined business school um, was part of their journey. So with that theme of inclusion and diversity and, you know, different um, members of society that each then have a voice, with your relationships that you also enjoy with corporates, you're the segue for businesses that want that diversity, right? They, they want those different voices. They want to have that sort of dialogue. Liz, it's a fairly open question. I'm not even sure what my question is, but perhaps just, you know, your perspectives on how business school can really foster the sort of diversity voices and leadership that society so badly needs. Yeah, I think there are definitely tangible ways that the career, service, the career services offices can help facilitate that connection and provide students with that access to the companies that they may be targeting or the industries, the functions they may be targeting. Like I'm thinking about kind of in a real way, the way that, you know, we connect students with different uh, affinity clubs, uh, excuse me, connect companies with different affinity clubs of students so that there can be specific networking events that happen throughout the year when a company is coming to campus to do a presentation. Uh, thinking about, you know, the, the different types of um, diversity recruiting activities that happen before students start in, in an MBA program, uh, different fellowships and events, networking opportunities, and trying to share those with admitted students before they come into the program so that they can be doing uh, a little bit of that connecting and learning and information gathering before they get started. So I think we play a role in helping to make those connections and being an advocate for the students, um, which is such an important part of our job. So hope that answers a little bit like that. That's it does. Kind of it, no, no, it yeah. does. I suppose then come back to, I mean, do you have a, a favorite story or an individual that, you know, was, was uncertain where the MBA sort of fit into their path and, you know, how, how it just opened up and um, where they were able to take it next? I'm sure you have lots of uh, great stories. Yeah, I mean, definitely lots of good stories. I mean, I feel like for me, the type of story that I tend to be most with students and the one that provides, I think, the most satisfaction is somebody comes in with a goal that may not be a traditional kind of structured post MBA goal. And so the connections that they're making are really about them kind of forging their own path um, and staying the course and not being distracted by 
all of the, the things that maybe their classmates are doing, but really staying focused. You know, when I, when I started working at Goizueta, I was a career coach that worked with all of the students who were um, non-consulting, non-finance, and non-marketing. Uh, and so that brings in a lot of students that I think have very specific goals, um, maybe in tech, maybe with a startup, maybe in healthcare, real estate, certainly social impact. And so when I think about those areas, maybe that are kind of, uh, you know, less structured when it comes to the MBA recruiting process, those are the stories that I tend to kind of hold, uh, hold on to as being the most satisfying um, for the students as well feel most satisfying because they're, they are continuing on a path that they thought they were going to do when they got started in the program and they stay true to that, that path in that yeah. process. Recruiters feel come to rice because of that diversity that you're able to bring together. They don't want just a, a cookie cutter and every graduate looking the same. Um, so, so, I mean, that, that really is um, a, a very symbiotic relationship that you enjoy and, and how, how that feeds into the sort of diversity that we want in society and the leadership roles that your graduates will go on to play. Uh, absolutely. You know, we, we all know we've seen it in the research that diverse teams make the most, uh, you know, the best decisions for organizations. And so I think it's important that we not only attract uh, and, and retain a, a diverse student body, we're one of the most, most diverse schools and in, in the most uh, diverse city in, in the country. And, and so it's something that's been a hallmark for us at Rice Business. It's been a, a priority for us because I, I, you know, business demands it. And one of the relationships that we, we nurture and we, we value is our relationship with the consortium. Uh, that's top of mind because this past Saturday we spent uh, all day with our uh, incoming students who will be participating in their orientation program uh, next week. And so it's programs like the Consortium, uh, Forte, and, and other uh, pre-MBA programs that are designed to um, not only attract uh, diverse uh, students into MBA programs, but also bring in the companies who also value that and bringing those two audiences together and, and getting them connected uh, so that uh, you know, students understand what options and are available to them and what, what businesses, what companies uh, share the same values as, as they do. Dimitri, if you had to finish this sentence for me, you don't have to go to business school to make a success of your career. But if you do, <laughs> how would you finish that sentence? But if you do, I you'll have a more uh, impactful and fulfilling career. I, I, I think I think business school allows students to, in their post-MBA career, feel like they're doing better work and are more in control of their own career, that they can they can drive the way to their uh, future much more so than they could, could without the degree. They understand how, how business functions, industries work, and, and feel like they have the tools the networks and the contacts to navigate that more effectively. Yeah, yeah, and, and, that, and that sense of, of purpose, is that something that you think you, you see more and more of? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that drew me to Ross uh, was it's um, careers with impact or business and impact, uh, social impact was, was what drew me to be a student at Ross. And it is the thing that, that kept me there too. Um, we have a new dean, or he's not so new anymore. He's been there for a few years now, but he, he made it a big priority. We have an associate dean of business plus impact. I work very closely with all the students who are interested in uh, careers with impact, so with nonprofits, education, and so on. And it, it's incredible, uh, that group of students um, and the passion they bring um, and the engagement we get with alumni and, and companies that are interested in that space as well. Uh, we have an Urban Institute, a, a dual degree program with the School of Environment and Sustainability. Um, and it is something that more and more, even if it is not the, the kind of thing you came to school for, it is something students care about. They tell me in those initial appointments that, you know, I'm interested in tech, but I want to combine that with a career with impact. Um, and so I think, I think companies are starting to, to pick up on that as well and, and trying to let students understand how uh, a career that might be viewed as more traditional could actually be a career with impact as well. So I think that's fantastic. Right. The last word, Sean, uh, as you know, markets show their volatility, why, why is the best move always to invest in yourself? Um, and so uh, I think, uh, you know, investing in yourself, uh, you know, really allows you to never have any regret for uh, decisions that you make. And um you know, I think, you know, a lot of us are looking for control. 
And, and, and the only thing we can really control in life is uh, us and our actions, right? And so that investment in yourself, uh, regardless of how it turns out, if you've taken ownership, controlled the situation, I think you'll feel, some, you, you'll feel a great level of fulfillment that, it, hey, at least I gave it a try. I took ownership, that kind of thing. Um, and and this, this generation of students, this, this, this breed here is, is, you know, I've been in the business for 15 years and sometimes they're misunderstood by people in my generation, uh, but they have a much greater sense of purpose and understanding of the impact of their actions than I think any generation before them, right? And, um, and, and I think um, they have this holistic view of the world that uh, I think is going to, you know, make the world a better place. You know, for me, the, my sense of purpose and, and, and doing this job is that I feel like business schools are leadership factories. And, and as you were saying earlier, I feel like the world needs more leaders, right? And so we, I think that's what gives us all a sense of purpose about what we do. Um, you know, I think, you know, the diversity of the, uh, the schools, uh, the business community needs them. You know, diversity has gone from being a social imperative to a business imperative for us. You know, the ability to take uh, students, uh, you know, companies say, hey, look, uh, we're based, my, the, the Asia PAC headquarters in Singapore, but I need someone who's, you know, has a cultural savvy and understanding enough to move into the different parts of wor the world. And I think through the diversity that you have in all these programs, you see, you know, the humanity in the other side and, and the, the common ground that you've had with a lot of these individuals. And I think it, you know, brings it back to, you know, you know, when you invest in you, you're also investing, uh, and, and, and when you invest in you in this kind of experience, you're also investing in others and their ability to bring out the best of you. Well, we've been describing you as the unsung uh, heroes, uh, and yet it's always the students and the alumni that sing your praises. I'm um, thrilled that we're able to give a chance to uh, share your voices with this uh, audience, because clearly the role that you play, the impact of your own work, um, you know, truly is transformational for so many of the students at your top schools. Thank you for taking an hour uh, to share so many thoughts and perspectives, um, the resilience, the agility, uh, and the importance of investing uh, in each and every one of ourselves. Um, I think that next steps, that we'll have some of the uh, attendees that will have some questions for you and you'll have the details to be able to join them. But uh, to each of you, to Liz, uh, Phil, Dimitri, Sean, thank you for the last hour and sharing this careers panel with us. Always a pleasure Thank working. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Good to connect with you all.